Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming to my session. I know you have choices, and I appreciate uh, a full room. It's nothing worse than if you speak and there are three people sitting there wondering what's going to happen. Um, I'm going to talk about transforming from the inside out and maybe a little bit upside down also. I'm sure you never heard about that. Well, uh, uh, we'll uh, shed some light on what that means. Uh, when I came here this morning, first question, like David, what do they always ask you first thing? How is your book selling, okay? Well, what do you do when you want to know how your book is selling? Well, you go to Amazon, okay? And that's what you see when you go to Amazon. I type my name, and what comes up? The little dog and the green horse. <laughs> and um, uh, actually, um, I learned something from this. I uh, bought these books, and I looked at uh, that green horse. I read that book, and the author says that he's in the business of writing absolutely silly stories. And he says, the more silly, the better they sell. Well, I learned something. From now on, I make silly presentations. And if I ever write a book again, I will write a silly book. Well, anyway, mine comes up too, but it's uh, just not making the, the hit list there. But anyway, I, uh, uh, I work at Goodyear, and um, we spend a lot of time on lean. And uh, uh, actually, at Goodyear, we make tires for everything that needs tires to move. And we're located, located on Innovation Way. Actually, we renamed the street uh, when we moved into the new innovation center there. And uh, here's the key. Here's why we need it lean. Every year at Goodyear, we launch 1,500 new products. Those are fully developed, tested, released, and, and so on. And um, we used to get them maybe 20% of them out on time and on target. And um, we couldn't stay in business that way. We had to figure out how can we launch all 1,500 on time, on target, and all new ideas and so on. So um, that's when we started Lean. And we did it in an innovation center. We did it in a creative uh, environment. And uh, we recently got um, the AME Operational Excellence Award for 2016. We'll get it uh, presented uh, end, end of this month at their conference in Dallas. And we are an R&D organization, we're an innovation center. They came in, their criteria are totally manufacturing, maybe a little bit looking at services, but we still got the award, no, no problem. That tells you how uh, universal those principles really are. And you can use them in healthcare services anywhere you want to. They are the same. So what's the innovator doing here? Well. Uh, Oh, first of all, uh, I tried three times, and uh, this, on the third time, Bruce eventually accepted my, uh, my submission for, to speak at the conference. And I think I know why. I changed my title. Uh, I'm now a lean champion. Before, I was a, a senior uh, master uh, black belt principal for innovation or for, for lean or something. And nobody invites a person with a title like that. So... Um, <laughs> I changed the title, and guess what? You know, immediately got an invite. But um, I'm here to talk, not to talk about innovation. I'm here to talk about lean. And uh, because it applies to the innovation creation process just like any other process. And what we learned, I can really share. I know you will be able to use it. The principles are the same. The problems are very identical. I work a lot with the hospital in, uh, in Akron, Ohio. Believe it or not, they have the same problem than we had. The, in the hospital, the patients was waiting. In our environment, the project was waiting. Uh, people were always busy everywhere, but we needed to learn how to get flow, how to get these projects out. At the hospital, they had to learn how to get the patient in quickly and back out quickly. And um, it's all about people, and that's what I want to talk about uh, today. Actually, I made a, uh, you know the house, uh, Shingo's, um, or, or Ono, they, I, I, most people build a house now when they start their lean um, journey, and I made it very generic. I said foundation and destination. Uh, you can put your own in there, but I hope you leave the pillars that I have on here. It's continuous improvement and it's respect for the people. 
Uh, this is my future state. This is the current state. Uh, it wasn't a good house at that time, but uh, that's what uh, we're going to talk about. And here's the problem out there. We have that problem, and I bet you, some of you, maybe more than, uh, than you know, have the problem of uh, people engagement. And they say the national average in the US, 70% of the people are not engaged. And uh, that is true. So it's very difficult to get a successful uh, lean transformation going when 70% of the people are not engaged. So I uh, share with you a little bit what we had to do to get uh, the people engaged in my company. So here's why we had to change. This is how our project management system looked like. Uh, we invented the term uh, log jam, by the way. <laughs> and um, we had all these projects thrown in the river and they were floating somewhere. Most of them got stuck somewhere. Uh, a lot of them never reached the end, but if they got to the end, uh, we had to sort a few out that uh, we had resources to launch. And then we discovered StageGate. So we went from uh, getting nothing finished to now getting nothing started anymore. <laughs> and, and then we invented project management. That's what it was. It was nothing but managing the congestion. We changed priorities constantly. Our leaders did nothing but rearrange uh, priorities. And this is how the people ended up. And that was not good. We wanted creativity from them, and we totally bogged them down in, in administration. So the next, we had to learn that we had to change. But it's no, change is not just redrawing an organization chart and telling the people, go do it. Maybe that works in your company. In, in my company, that did not work at all. We had to get that stubborn horse move in the right direction. And we needed a path, uh, and we selected uh, the oldest one that was out there. Uh, Jim Womack wrote this in, I think, 96 uh, in his book, uh, uh, Lean Thinking, except that he didn't put them in a circle. And, uh, we call this the Womack wheel, and uh, Jim told me he didn't know he had wheels, but uh, at Goodyear, we always think round, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, at the end, uh, we ended up here. We actually created a lean operation. If you did all this work and you don't give it a home, if you don't institutionalize it, it will die on you. So we actually did create a lean operation who uh, now, that operation is in charge of managing the process, improving the process, learning. It's just like any other function in, in the company. So we'll talk about this change process a little more here. And um, top-down transformation. I just heard it from uh, Art uh, Byrne. He is the leader there, and he says, we're going to do this. And guess what? He says, people are doing it. So if I ask you, how many are you, uh, of you here are the leaders of a company? No hands, all of you, thank you. How many of you are just like me? Somebody in the company that got appointed to bring the company along now and uh, do all this lean stuff and get this done and, uh, and make this successful. Well, thank you. So bottom-up transformation. Anybody ever heard about that? So which one of the two is more successful? Who thinks it's top down? Who thinks it's bottom up? Who thinks say, they are, there's no difference? Well, I guess you're right. If you, there is really not a big difference. It's just a different way to get the people engaged. So here is what uh, I thought was the magic word. Support. I mean, put them up and get the support. So I had the support from our uh, CTO on this. He was the leader of the, of the center, of the innovation center, and I did have his support. So life is good. I said, Man, am I so lucky I got his support. And uh, I just told the people, hey, uh, Jean-Claude Keen wants this. Let's do it. And then one day, uh, Jean-Claude called me to his office, and he closed the door. That's always a bad sign at Goodyear, <laughs> but they closed the door. And he said, that's not going to work. And I said, what do you mean? He said, don't ever mention my name. 
okay, well, uh, you just took my uh, biggest thing away that I had. Uh, and then I had to learn that it has to work without mentioning his name. It, if you got the support, if it comes from the top down, or if you do it from the bottom up, and you have the support, you, need, you cannot just think that's it and then um, think you got it made. You really have to get the people engaged. So I like this model, inside out. And uh, maybe I talk a little bit about later when I get to the leadership, I talk a little bit uh, how to get leaders involved and engaged. Talk about uh, the upside down. So I want to start 6th century BC with uh, Lao Tzu. He was the founder of Taoism. He said, go to the people, live with them, learn from them, build with what they have. But with the best leaders, when the work is done, the task accomplished, the people will say, we have done this ourselves. This is not new, but uh, this is still true today just as well as it was back then. <laughs> Except to be lean, we would say it in three words, now or in half a sentence, but uh, that would be the only difference. So who, is the, who are the best positioned people to make recommendations about changing the work uh, they do? And I say recommendations. Who's the best positioned? Well, the people who do the work. It's a no-brainer. But I say recommendations. I'm not saying tell everybody to go change what they are doing. It is OK for leadership to know what they are doing. Uh, but you, they have to be responsible for it. But the ideas have to come from them. I'm glad we agree all on that. So we, uh, from here on, it's going to get easy. So the job of the inside out change leader. It's have to get the people from we have to do this to we want to do this. It has to be their idea. They have to be, a, they have to be wanting to do this. And uh, my first step is learn the principles. In, step, in, in, in fact, now I'm getting very close to what Art Byrne was saying uh, this morning. Learn the principles. Teach the principles to the people who do the work. And then coach and let the people who do the work apply the principles. At the end, you may not have the process that you had in mind when you started. But you may have something better, but you definitely have something that has a chance to work. And it doesn't matter if this is factory workers, engineers, like in our case, service providers, doctors at a hospital, I don't think that makes a difference. So here are the 11 steps that I learned. Do your homework. Uh, that's one where I flunked on miserably when I started the transformation at Goodyear. Um, I thought organization changes. It's just read wrong an organization chart, right? And putting the people in the right positions, and then they will do whatever has to be done. Uh, get leverage, very important. We started lean uh, at a major strike at Goodyear. We had a uh, five-month strike in 2006. And that was the right time to start. Because all the work got stopped, I mean all development work, and we started with a new slate, and we started with a new process. So if you have that luck, um, I mean not the luck of a strike, of course. We took a bad situation here but really took advantage of it. Engage the right people to lead the change, the right leader, the right team. Develop a vision. This is all straightforward. You do need some kind of a support. Uh, I abused it. That's what I learned. But you do need uh, some kind of support. You cannot over-communicate or over-train. And then deal with resistance. It's hidden out there. In my case, we had the worst, I had the worst resistance that uh, you can imagine. A leader in the organization had told all his people to come up with anything they can come up to shoot this down. He said, I need arguments. I need the best arguments. We need to kill this. I never even knew about it. They told me uh, uh, years uh, later. Engage the employees. We're going to sp uh, uh, spend more detail on that. Uh, we're also going to talk about this some more. Do good things and talk about them. That's a German uh, proverb. And remember the PDCA and then uh, sustain the change. So if you want to take a picture, I'll leave it up for a second.
I don't know if they share the slides, but anyway, if you don't get it, uh, uh, drop me a uh, card, I will mail it to you. Okay, we get uh, back to it anyway. So, this was the empirical way. I have no idea about um, any of this. This is what we did. We learned along the way. It was a, a, a difficult learning. But then I met this gentleman. His name is uh, Arnu uh, Harrimans. And he is a doctor. He's a, uh, an, um, he actually practiced medicine, uh, behavioral science, mostly psychology and so on, uh, in Europe. And he specialized in lean now. And uh, he says, here is the desired behavior that he sees for uh, an organization uh, if you want to transform. They must take ownership of the work process and continuously improve that process by gaining deeper understanding of that process. And I met this gentleman a few, actually a few weeks ago. I said, man, this is what we try to do. So I wrote down uh, the four steps that he says are important. It's motivation. It's condition that's like rewarding, like positive reinforcement. Uh, and he actually used uh, uh, how to train a dog for that. And then uh, stress control. I didn't know that. That's a huge, big motivator for the people here. And I show you an example how, uh, how we took advantage of that. And this is difficult. Cognitive dissonance, it's focus on behavior, and the beliefs will follow automatically. I will have an illustration uh, uh, of that for you. Uh, here in, at the end of the presentation. So I felt a little bit good because here's an expert, a scientist, behavioral scientist, and we actually used uh, several, uh, all of his uh, key points here. So here are the, the four that I want to spend a little more time on, uh, communication, training, engaging, uh, this uh, German proverb, and then uh, sustaining. Uh, Communication and training. Traditionally, you tell people what to do. You focus on the what, of course. But we need to focus on the how, but especially we need to focus on the why. And uh, Bruce uh, Hamilton actually told me, his kids told him the five whys. Why do I have to do this? Well, by the way, in the Japanese culture, uh, I understand that doesn't happen very often. Uh, if they ask why, it's because they want to understand, not like my kids question, why do we have to do this, okay? And uh, they will understand that. But that communication has to be two-way. You have to listen also. And uh, the most important thing is train, train, and train again. Uh, we did lean training at least three times for the same group of people until it really sunk in. Uh, why do we want to engage the people? Well, you all knew it. They know the process. You cannot just replace them. Um, that's, I, I put that there because we had a consultant come in and said, OK, uh, we went through a major change in the company. Uh, things, uh, we were terribly affected by the crisis in 2008, the automotive crisis. And when we get out of it, we had a consultant come in and uh, that consultant says, you have to replace your people now. Because the people who got you out of this are not the best people to lead you forward. Well, in my case, uh, by the way, Goodyear didn't do it, and I'm glad. In my case, that didn't work at all, because I still have all the same people there than we had before the, the transformation. They are just the experts. They are the best tire engineers that we can find. You cannot replace those. They can improve the work. They also have to sustain it, unless uh, you want to stay there forever as the, the, the change agent. Engagement motivates the people. So just a few words on motivation. The number one thing, and I'm sure you agree on this, the number one thing that motivates people, if you want them to do their work different, it's what's in there for me. If you make it easier and better, and especially less stress, you get their buy-in very, very, very quickly. Most, and this is my, uh, something I had to really learn. People come to work to do a good job. I have yet to see somebody who comes in in the morning saying, hey, how can I screw up today? How can I really screw up uh, uh, today? People don't do that. People come to work to do a good job. And uh, they like to get appreciated for it. And um, seeing small results, very important. 
Uh, if you do work, 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 and you never see where it's going, eh, maybe that's not the best model. Leadership's interest in people, not only the outcome. I mean, results are important, but process is important too, and the people who do the work, very important. And then receiving a thank you. That's the lowest cost way you can motivate people, just stopping by their desk and saying thank you. Our chief technical officer does this all the time. He walks by, uh, he doesn't just drop by. He makes an effort to go to people's desk and just thanking them for what they did. Cost nothing, cost two minutes of his time. Definitely the most powerful thing you can do. And here we go, here's the motivation uh, on uh, Arno's um, uh, four behavioral um, uh, items. And also the stress control, I want to say a word about that. An engineer at Goodyear worked on 15 things at the same time. Ever heard about that? What do you call it, multitasking? You all work on many different things at the same time? Yeah? Well, does that cause stress? I guess it does. We have a system now, one person, one job at one time. That's it. One person, one job at one time. It took a while to get there. But they are not working on three things at the same time anymore. And I mean, people are happy, very happy, because it takes an enormous amount of stress uh, uh, off of them. So that is really a, a good point. Uh, I think that's an important point. And recognition, the easiest way to do it. You put their picture in the newspaper. People love it. Again, it's not, uh, there's no money in the budget for this because you don't need it. Now, demotivation, you probably know this. Use of lean to eliminate jobs, only to save money. Uh, too many changes. Every year we had something else. And you knew when it was coming. And it just had a different name sometimes. Making work harder, work harder, that unfortunately, every, most change, people end up with more work and harder. We're having to work with more complicated, more bureaucracy. Um, working hard and improvement, never seeing the results, and then failure to recognize people. In fact, um, taking credit for what a team did is probably the worst thing you can do if you want to demotivate them. If you want to, if a leader takes the credit for the work that the team did, it's going to be hard to find people uh, uh, soon for the next Kaizen event. So how to engage the people? Well, the number one is to show respect. Communicate, teach why, listen to their concerns. You don't have to do everything that you hear, but at least you have to listen to it. You may not be able to do everything that you hear, but at least you have to listen to it. And then um, focus on the influencers. There are those people out there who can drag other people along. Focus on those first. And then go see, build trust, help, support, and then thank people. So um, there you go, that's the conditioning part, uh, uh, rewarding the, the good behavior. Now I have to tell you a story how I learned respect, respect for people, what that is. I was a total non-people person. In fact, I had decided to go on the, we have, at Goodyear we have a management uh, career and then we have a dual or whatever you call it, dual track, uh, second track, technical ladder or whatever. I had opted to go in the technical ladder because dealing with people was not my thing. But I wish I had learned this early in my career. I think I would have chosen a different uh, one. And it took very, very little. Uh, when we started Lean, I had a lot of, we, had, we were way overstaffed at that time. We had all these people coming in from Six Sigma and so on. And uh, some of my colleagues had discovered uh, a way to get people engaged. It was uh, making fun of the processes. And we had terrible processes. And people laughed. People had a good time. And uh, eventually, a lot of that thing was stretched more and more because uh, it wasn't following reality anymore. And then all of a sudden, they made fun of a process that I, I had implemented a few years before. And it made a lot of sense. To, to do what we did. That, that really, it was the best solution. But 
everybody had forgotten the context and so on. And then the people that I worked with at that time came to me and said, you tolerating that? What? I mean, they felt really, really bad. Here are good people. And they did the best thing at that time we had to do for the company. And now people are making fun of them. And I said, this is something here that I never understood before. And those people were good people. And I really appreciated more and more what they did for me at that time when we changed that process. I thought by myself, why? That maybe is the way to look at what everybody in the company does. They are the biggest experts uh, in the company. They come do a good job. And if they cannot do a, a good job, it maybe is not their fault. Maybe they work in a terrible process, or maybe they don't have the right training, or maybe they don't have the right qualification or equipment or whatever it, it may be. They are the best people you have. Let's appreciate them. And uh, ask questions and not give answers. Again, very hard for me to learn. I always knew the answer while well, I told them. Well, I don't do that anymore. I ask questions I, until I see that they got it, and then it's fine. If they got it, let them do it, and maybe coach them a little bit uh, along. Hard on the process, easy on the people. Now, here is um, the German proverb, and it means, uh, it, uh, I don't need to quote it in German, but uh, um, I found a reference to it. This lady lived in the 30s. Her name is um, Virginia Satir. She was a psychologist, and she was specialized on working people who went through a big hardship, a family or, or whatever. And she said, uh, this is actually the way she described it. People are OK in the current state. And then all of a sudden, uh, a change happens. And the first thing is uh, resistance because Things go bad, and we don't want to do it. People don't like to change, but uh, often they don't have a choice. And then we go way down. But then she says, once in a while, something good happens. And she says, it's the skill of a change leader to catch those good things and uh, talk about them as much as you can. Uh, reward the people for it. Uh, make an example out of it, and so on and so on. And that will get you on the way to a better uh, state, to a better uh, where people cope with the situation. And very often, you're much better off uh, after the change. But you need to catch those things when people do something right. And I read this the other day. They were always, celebrate the red. Okay, All we do is focus on the red. Well, somebody, uh, I remember who said it, find the green and use it to get more green. How about that? And uh, then thank the people for doing something right, for doing something good. Uh, you have to have to sustain in mind when you start. And i just give you one uh, quick example of that. Um, people who break out of jail, 95% uh, get caught within 10 miles of the jail. You know why that is? Uh, that's a fact, the statistics, you can look that up. You know what that is? They made no plans what to do when they get out. They made great plans how to get out. And all of a sudden, they're out there, what am I going to do now? And um, if they had, uh, a lot of people do transformations the same way. Focus on the transformation. And nobody thinks about, what am I going to do when that's all implemented now? Because I don't want to stay on the job and keep working on it. So those plans, you really have to think when you, when you start. Because um, that makes or breaks the, uh, your effort at the end. OK, now we get to the fun part. Now we talk about leadership. Uh, this is Billy Taylor. Billy is the director. Uh, North American uh, manufacturing at Goodyear. Maybe some of you may uh, have seen Billy. Billy does great presentations. And uh, this is Alice Jones. And Billy works for Alice. Alice is the plant manager uh, in Akron in the plant where we make the NASCAR tires. And this is Earl and Jim. And Alice works for Earl and Jim. 
Earl and Jim are actually the best NASCAR tires uh, builders that you can find. They are also proud members of the Steel Wor uh, United Steelworkers Union, and they are the best NASCAR uh, uh, tire builders that I know. Anything wrong with this picture? Well, this is our development organization. This is Joe, and Joe is the, the CTO and our, our chief operating officer. And he works for Andy Weimer, who is my boss. And Andy works for me. And I work for those people. Those are the best engineers we have. And somebody needs to support them and respect uh, the work that they are doing. So you know this leadership model? So what do these, peop these birds at the bottom, what do they see when they look up? <laughs> OK, we got it. <laughs> well, I like to turn that upside down, OK? That's where the upside down comes in. And this is my model of leadership. To first and foremost support the people. Be a member of the team. So how do we get there? How do we can, uh, can we get people? Um, uh, that's a very uh, question I, I, I get all the time. People ask this at conferences. How do I get leadership engaged? I got all these great ideas. And I have everybody, all the, my uh, staff, everybody likes them. They are engaged in them. How do I get leadership engaged? Especially the middle. You may get the, the, the president say, great idea. I support you. but. What about all the people in between there? So you can tell them, not very effective. You can show them, now it's much better. Take them to a company who does it well and show them how other leaders are doing it. But they never have time for that. So, and let them experience it. Now we're going to get somewhere. Uh, the motivation for them is that they finally get time to do what they always would like to do anyway. But they, they always go from one fire to the next, to the next, to the next, and they never get time to do what they really should be doing, leading people, setting strategy, coaching people, and so on and so on. Uh, middle management is the hardest uh, that uh, most people who manage big change agree on that. They are the busiest, and uh, they really have the most fires. And there is enough in them for them to motivate them. So here's my uh, idea. And uh, uh, I'm uh, glad I can share that with David Mann. He, uh, I found out, uh, David is an expert on this subject. I found out much later that we really had the same idea here. I didn't even know David when we started. So I call it the magic triangle. And I use it as a primer. You have to uh, put something out there that they can teach themselves that they can experience, that they can uh, learn, that they can improve. Now we're talking. Just to tell them, have a PowerPoint slide after PowerPoint slide, how good leadership is done, did not work for me at all. But this somewhat works. So you have visual management. Uh, you're probably all familiar with that. The 10 second rule, within 10 seconds, I need to see uh, where the pain points uh, are. Go see, you have to go out, see, go on the floor, look what's going on. Uh, see what people are doing, see where they struggle. And then uh, you do need a formal problem solving. If a problem comes up, you need to make sure that somebody is responsible to address that problem to, to solve it. And I uh, threw David's in here, but David, we can't read them very well here. Um, visual controls, uh, uh, leader standard work. Leader standard work and accountability. And this is what it all uh, turns out to be. I don't want to be disrespectful to monkeys here. But um, when we implemented lean, the biggest complaint was you made it monkey work. Engineers have standard work now. So they don't have to take time anymore to think about how they do their job. Leaders, their job is reduced to the triangle. Visual management, see where your problems are, go out and see them, go see what's going on, and have a problem-solving process in place that all the pain points, all the problems get addressed. 
Now, all of a sudden, they say, well, I went, I studied here for years in school, and I have 20 years company experience, and I learned to be a firefighter. I learned to uh, solve problems my way, and so on. And now, all of a sudden, it becomes very easy. So what I tell them is, we don't pay you to figure out how to do your job. We pay you to figure out what to do. So take that time and be creative. Develop better products. Develop better people. Develop better processes. And now all of a sudden, I think that starts to sink in. So the, how we do the work got so much easier now that we really have time to spend on the real thing. And a uh, few ideas on growing organic uh, lean leaders. Uh, that is their job, uh, to uh, uh, the, the triangle, to go see what good looks like. Opportunities for self-development helps very well. Practice, go see, respect, trust, and uh, learn to ask questions. Uh, leaders have the right to know what people are doing. So um, that often gets confused. A lot of people think this is about letting everybody do whatever they want to do. Well, that can lead to a lot of chaos and a lot of waste also. They have a right to know because they are responsible for it too. They are responsible to align everything and so on. And they are allowed to question it. Not because of people's abilities, but is it the right thing for the organization? So they have the right to know but should not take the responsibility for it. And then coach and uh, for, uh, coach problem solving. That's You can actually coach people uh, John Shook taught me that a long time ago. You can coach people uh, to become better problem solvers. That's very good development um, uh, for people. So the last one, cognitive dissonance. Very complicated. And I uh, want to use uh, a personal example here. Uh, my personal transformation was the hardest. I led um, transformation at Goodyear in the Innovation Center, uh, globally about 2,500 people working there. And we really turned that total organization lean in um, about 10 years' time frame. And it was not inside out at all, uh, what I had to learn. Uh, here's the cognitive dissonance. Focus on the behaviors the beliefs will follow. And that, this is what happened to me. I didn't want to do this. And I had told our CTO who wanted me to do this, and I pretty much made it clear that I am not interested in this job, not at all. And he wouldn't give up. And, uh, but I, um, I had no interest. This was all about people. I didn't like it. I had no interest in it. And then he said, well, what about uh, just do uh, a little training here. You've done Six Sigma training. You know how to do it. Just do a little training. And I, OK, OK, I did a little training. And while I'm doing the training, he shows up to every training. He had his uh, admin put it on his calendar, and he shows up at every training. And he stands in front of the people at least for half an hour and trains some of the 2,500 people in Lean Principle every time we did it. And I kept, uh, man, this is, why does he show up every time? He must be really serious about this stuff. So I kept training, and by the time I uh, trained for a while, I had totally changed my behaviors. And beliefs was not an issue anymore. And uh, this uh, scientist, that's what he says. It's very well proven. You focus on the behaviors, he says, and beliefs will change like the leaves in the fall. And I really have to say, I have no idea about this. But it worked. So train, train, and train. And in fact, um, a lot of companies, when they have a problem with somebody buying in or uh, whatever, they ask them to do training. They put them in charge of coaching. They, put them, uh, they send them to the training department and have them uh, train for a while, which leads to change the behaviors which leads to change the beliefs. I always thought it had the other way around. I thought people had to make, you have to make them believers, and then they change their behavior. And for leadership, this works better, I think, than make them change their beliefs. But here's the problem. Good change agents have to change first. And that was the difficult part for me. But uh, the, now 
I, I watch, and if I see uh, people who are very successful leading a lean transformation without authority, okay, that's pretty much uh, a given. They changed first. Whether they realized it, like me, I didn't, but uh, whether they realized it or not. Anyway, here is the advice to those of you who lead in a, transform a lean transformation and can't just, and are not the president of the company. Uh, say no three times. Uh, ono uh, was very good at that. You're a change agent, not a project manager. A lot of people uh, say, hey, I'm a change agent, and really they're just a project manager. Project managers don't have to go through all this uh, selling and uh, getting people engaged. Educate yourself than others. Uh, do the transformation with your people inside out and upside down, but have the right expectations. It's a long journey, many restarts, and rarely the right recognition. Most companies do not have a career path for change agents or for uh, lean leaders. Sorry. My company finally did it, but I had to fight for it for about five years. And learn to respect people and become a teacher and a coach. You will need it, because teaching is really what uh, gets you everybody uh, engaged, and, uh, and uh, that's how you change the behaviors, that's how you make believers. And I think everybody can do this. So, as a summary, uh, change must be understood and well managed inside out. Engage the people, teach, coach, to, and uh, do it with the people who do the work. Leadership must be engaged, and uh, I like the upside down model. It worked, uh, I see it work many times. And uh, to be quite honest, my boss uh, keeps asking me, well, what should our lean strategy be? And I said, that's it. He said, no, we need to, we need to do this, 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 and next we need to teach this, and said, no. We need to teach our people who do the work. They will figure it out. And we can coach them along that way. But I do not like a strategy where from the top down you tell people, do this, do this, do this. I guess you must have noticed that in this presentation. So anyway, um, there is my uh, contact information. Uh, feel free to email me. I will answer emails. And I think we have time for questions. Okay, five minutes. But I'm here the next two days, so if you... I know, can you explain the say no three times? Oh, okay. Uh, actually, I learned that um, a cousin of mine uh, married a lady from uh, Iran. And part of the ceremony is when he asked her to be his wife, she had to say no three times. That's why I picked this. But um, uh, I like... Uh, you need to gauge if uh, whoever asks you to do this is serious. If this is not a fad of the month, I want no piece of it, okay? And if, if I say no, I don't want to do it, and I get asked again, and if I get asked again, I know my leader is serious about this. And that's the simplest way, and it has worked for me because I knew that I had the support. I wasn't allowed to use the name, but I knew that I had the support. Okay, any other questions? Can you talk about learning to coach? Because a lot of senior people tend to be, again, just at giving the answer and not asking the question. To me, that's a skill that many of us are not taught. Did you have a specific coaching class, or how did you do that? I think most leaders have learned it many times that they shouldn't do that, but they do it anyway. It's the habit, and it got, they think it got them where they are today. My, um, my biggest, uh, what helps me the most with leaders is take them to uh, other places and show them how other good leaders do the work. And um, they need to uh, get convinced that uh, not every leader behaves like that. That is very, very, very difficult because it gets into personal preferences and styles and culture and, uh, and you name it. Very, very difficult. But I did have, I, um, we had the worst uh, leader who would do that. Absolutely the worst. He was about this big, this tall, about this big, and he was convinced that's how you lead. And when he retired, 
I wanted to tape him for an interview, and uh, unfortunately uh, that uh, never took place for other reasons. But he gave me his slides, okay? And I, uh, it is absolutely amazing how that person had totally changed his mind. And uh, now I use these slides in, in training, in leadership. In fact, I put them out, I don't tell them who it was, and I let the class um, take these apart and uh, uh, see what uh, good uh, leadership behaviors are in there or lean leadership behaviors are in there. And then at the end, I tell them who it was. And of course, everybody is amazed. Um, to me, that's the best thing I have <laughs> Uh, and in the company, it works very well because everybody knows who he was just when I start talking about it. And it's like, man, if, when he got, when he turned around, then I think there is something to it. Any other? You have a few more minutes. Um, with the steps, the second one you write is made in relation to the USW, but when you talk about get leverage, what, what, why is that the second step when you do that? Um, people are not very motivated. If everything goes fine, if they think uh, things are going great, they are not very motivated to completely change the way they work, the, the way they do things. Um, uh, Jim Womack talks uh, at length in the book um, Lean Thinking about that, and Jim even says if you don't have that, you have to create. People, after a big, uh, if you have a company made an enormous uh, loss and it has to lay off people because that's what Wall Street wants, the next day you can get everybody buy into whatever you want to do, okay? But if things are going great, how do you? cause this leverage? How do you create this leverage? In our case, um, I could not have, things were doing okay. We were not making, uh, during that time when we had the strike, things were doing good. We were making money, uh, we were producing new products, uh, things were, life was good. So how do we convince them at that time? So we used an event like that to, um, to get the leverage. Very important, by the way. It, uh, our organization in Europe didn't have that, and it was much, much, much harder to get them convinced to do things differently. What was the uh, change management model that you used? Motivation, stress control, Oh, that came from a behavioral scientist. Uh, he is a um, he. Uh, uh, he uh, lives in the Netherlands, uh, Arnu um, uh, Hermans is his name. Uh, I can give you his uh, contact, and you can look him up. Um, he he uh, practiced, uh, uh, well, is it medicine? I mean, uh, he, he was a, um, a psychi psychologist who, um, uh, who worked at a major uh, hospital and um, all of a sudden discovered uh, lean and um, and uh, so, uh, now he's a big time consultant and he consults companies in, uh, in how to uh, help them do big changes like this. And those are the four that he came up with. And uh, I was just happy that I could see the four at least. <laughs> and, uh, because we, I have a totally empirical model, but. Uh, Last call. One more. Okay, well, uh, thanks everybody.